In case you've missed the previous episodes, I am locked down in Namibia as a tourist with my Land Rover in what would prove to be a year-long stay in the country. To have fun during the time I was there, I grabbed some camera gear and started to teach myself to film with a view to share some of the beauty and experiences that I knew I would encounter based on my previous seven years of overland travel visiting almost every country in Africa. My name's Darren. Jump in the passenger seat with me as we explore the remote areas and wildlife of Africa. At the end of the previous episode, I'd managed to patch the landy up in the capital and escape up to the very remote desert regions of the northwest, and had just arrived in the tiny village of Puros with the aim to settle down for a while and start to unbox some of my new camera equipment and learn how to use it. I'm assuming you've heard of Africa, but maybe not Namibia, which is located down here in between South Africa and Angola. Puros is located in the very northwest of the country, in what's known as the Kununi region, with the namesake river providing the border with Angola. And for this series we will be exploring the area between Puros and the river border. It's part of a desert region that covers the entire 1500 km coastline of Namibia and well into both of its neighbours. Much of the Kununi region is home to Himba people. I'm not qualified to comment too much on their culture or way of life, except I like the ones I've made friends with. They are free open spirits and they've always treated me well. Himba women are famous for the perfumed paste they rub on themselves as a cosmetic that symbolises the elements they hold dear in life, such as earth and blood. It helps cleanse the skin over long periods when water is scarce and offers protection from both the fierce sun and insect bites. And it looks pretty cool as well. If you do ever get the chance to meet some Himba, they will be amazed if you speak a few words of their language. And it's super easy to remember the word for hello, it's the same as a lovely chocolate bar in New Zealand. Moro! You might be wondering, how do people manage to live in Puros? Well, there's no magic tricks, just nature. Starting at Puros, the mostly dry riverbed snakes through a long canyon, down through the Skeleton Coast National Park and out towards the Atlantic Ocean. Water tends to sit in the canyon at various places and provides a year-round fresh water supply, provided it's topped up with the occasional downpour upstream. We are here during the end of the rainy season, so we will stay out of the narrow confines of a canyon for now, in case we get trapped by a flash flood. This handsome gentleman goes by the name of Chips. I've never asked exactly why, but it's maybe not hard to guess. The photo was taken in 2010 on a previous visit to Puros. If we step forward to April 2020, and Chips is still going strong and running a beautiful campsite with his family in the village riverbed. It was a great feeling to drive across the dry riverbed and arrive finally at Chips' campsite. At this stage, I was just happy to be here. At last, after a hectic month, I could unwind a bit and take my time unboxing some of the camera equipment I'd brought to play with and gather my thoughts a bit around what I was hoping to film and create. I had all the gear, but no idea at this stage, so to speak. I just spent two weeks isolating and fixing my landy up, but having been to a few shops and petrol stations since, I wanted to avoid contact with people for a few days, so we will catch up with Chips later on. To allay the fears of a few kind people who care about me, like my auntie Fee in New Zealand, I thought I'd film the one thing that people ask me about the most. So this is the donkey system. As I said, it's a, in this case, I think an old uh, diesel oil drum. Um, the concrete around the plumbing side of things is to keep the elephants away. Um, they'll smell the water, they'll break the pipe and uh, get the water out of it. And as you can see underneath we've got a fire, it's nice and warm, I can feel it from here. It's been going for a while. And uh, yeah, that will give me a beautiful hot shower. And. Uh, this is the shower room and next to it is the toilet. Have a quick look in the toilet. It's a very nice uh, toilet here. Got a hand basin in the middle for washing your clothes or whatever you want to do. But yeah, the toilet's very nice. It flushes very well. Look at that. Cleaner than my one at home. <laughs> All right, enough dilly-dallying. Let's get into the shower. A 
Okay, job done. Feeling like a million bucks, I have to say. So looking forward to dinner, nice sunset, and a nice quiet sleep. Hopefully with no elephant smashing into the Land Rover. <laughs> That's happened before. This is the elephant-proofed water well. They won't risk climbing down into it, and the pump is protected as well as it can be with what nature provides. However, boys will be boys, and when I next came through Puros in a later series, the male elephants had destroyed my shower block to get to the water pipe. For me, Namibia has the best campsites in the world. Beautiful settings, and the bare necessities done really well. All you really need is a way to get clean at the end of the day, and life seems like heaven. Perhaps the best way to give you a flavour of the area is via the mini adventures around Puros I had over the next few days playing with my new camera gear, and the microphone I'd specially purchased for use in the noisy cab. First little go with all the camera mounts. So I've got some on the back, up high and down low, and all sorts of stuff. Somewhere I'll find the microphone module for this and give us better, get a better audio because I'm sure this is kind of user, unusable. This is mostly sandy, which is why I'm enjoying the uh, the drive. Ah, yeah, it's horrendous. But this is a good test just to see if I can actually talk at normal volume, if it's listenable, can I edit the audio, etc. It's interesting to see this footage, uh, see what the camera shake is like more than anything. I don't think this uh, is very good at that. I really couldn't be happier. Putting along in third gear in Africa on a dirt track. I prefer it less corrugated, obviously. Ah, oh, okay, we're back onto the uh, main road now. Must be well over 40 degrees. So rather than just sitting and sweating all afternoon, it's nice at about 3 o'clock just to go for a bit of a drive. So this is about as bad as it gets, I would say, with the vents open, the window open, etc. And just talking to see what it's like. Now, when I get a, a flat place, I'm gonna flip it around and see if it'll pick up me. What I'd like the camera to do is move a little bit more to pick up me, but it's uh, not quite doing that. All right, let's get a bit more scenery. Just got to tilt the camera a little bit just to uh, adjust it, but that's pretty good. It's nice and easy. Now the key is, you know, does it does it make a good film? Is the audio good enough? After a few days, I started to feel confident that I'd mastered the basics of my three action cameras, so I moved on to the drone that I'd bought. What better place to capture from up high amazing sweeping scenery shots of the majestic Landy bravely ploughing through the desert. It was a bit intimidating taking it out of the box for the first time. I'd never used a drone before and I'm sorry to say, I still haven't. Upon turning it on and trying to activate it, it reported three major components were defective and it wouldn't work. Thinking maybe a firmware upgrade or something might fix it, I took a 10 hour round trip back down to Sesfontein to use the 3G internet signal down there. But even after a frustrating night updating it, no go. It was broken and would never work. £900 wasted and no chance of a warranty fix or replacement for what turned out to be over a year. That's unfortunately life on the road sometimes. 
You just have to be thankful for what does work and allows you to keep going. This did at least allow me to concentrate on the one thing that I was more afraid of than the drone, my dreaded proper camera with interchangeable lenses, wireless microphones and more buttons and settings than a spaceship. I had some idea of the basics of photography, things like aperture and shutter speed I understood individually, but collectively I wasn't quite sure how it all added up. Okay, uh, so this is just a quick eye focus test to see if it's getting me in focus or not. Uh, I've got a slightly bright background there, uh, but it should be light enough to be picking me up. The heat was also a bit of a challenge. I, I don't know, it must be high 40s at least. It's pretty much impossible to do anything. I can't think very well. Uh, I can't concentrate. So I'm concentrating on doing nothing and uh, doing it badly. <laughs> You can see here how sometimes the picture went purple on the action cameras as they got too hot and then usually turned themselves off. And the sun was often so bright you couldn't see the screen, so you had to guesstimate what you were filming. No worries though, as I had anticipated most of this from previous travels, so I had swapped my trusty desktop computer for a new MacBook Pro, with an idea to be able to view shots and rough edit along the way allowing me to learn each day as I went and correct or improve by filming accordingly. However, the second major disappointment after the drone was to be the Mac. To cut a long story short, I soon found out that the new model sucked electricity very quickly when it needed to be recharged, and no solution had yet been developed that didn't burn out from the heat generated when recharging it from 12 volt vehicle batteries. On previous journeys with previous MacBooks, this had never been a problem. In the rush of leaving, I had grabbed the two solutions that said they could do this. However, one caught on fire and burned itself out the first time I used it, and the other would get extremely hot after 20 minutes of charging, and I just didn't trust it. The only solution was to do exactly that though. Charge it for 20 minutes, then let the charger cool down. Slow work when temperatures were around 45 degrees each day. This effectively turned my £4,000 laptop into something that I struggled to copy the video files to before its battery went flat, as opposed to the heavily upgraded beast I'd purchased to review and edit 4K video files on. Therefore I couldn't watch all of the camera tutorials that I'd brought with me, nor learn by filming and watching on the laptop. And I certainly couldn't edit and upload as I went along if I wanted to present myself well and in 4K resolution. So this is my little bush office. <laughs> I've parked under the best tree I can find uh, to get the most shade and uh, I'm just here with my laptop I'm copying all the uh, all the footage I have onto an external hard drive and then I copy it onto another there's a lot of dust around today so once I start the file copying then I put this down close the lid and uh, Try and keep the dust out as much as possible. This was a major blow. Maine's electrical connections would be few and far between in the areas I like to hang out in. I had the electricity to charge it from the batteries, but no suitable technology to safely get the charge into the MacBook. The drone and the MacBook then combined with some other news I had. Annoyingly, uh, brilliantly, um, and everything in between, I have uh, a potential job offer. Uh, waiting for the company to come back to me, waiting to conduct some interviews over the internet. Um, when these can be lined up, I need to go to a lodge or, or some sort of town with decent 3G internet. So to be perfectly honest, I lost the motivation to film here and that was the end of the channel idea. It seemed like I'd be heading back to civilization to find a lodge to stay in and work from until I could get home. It seemed like there were going to be some repatriation flights coming up. It had been an ambitious plan cooked up under pressure, but you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'd given it a go and maybe for another day. In some ways it was a relief in the 45 degree heat. I was just adding stress to my life that I'd probably never get any joy or reward from. It was too hard to be honest to try and learn blindly and there'd be no cool drone shots in the desert which had captured my imagination. 
And to be successful online, you need to constantly promote yourself in every direction. And I really struggle with social media. It makes me anxious when I use it. I really don't like it. So knowing that I wouldn't have to try and promote myself relentlessly like an idiot afterwards was, to be honest, quite a relief. I'd either work or just get on with enjoying my travels like I'd always done and use the gear to capture the odd shot for myself when I felt like it. Packing my way through the Botswana bush here. An annoying but kind of comforting decision taken in the heat of the Puros day. Extremely hot, um, absolutely covered in sweat here. So that was the end of this channel before it even really started. See ya. Luckily, slowly, the old Kiwi spirit started to kick in as the days rolled by. The job offer dragged on and on, one message per week outlining the next micro step to take, so I started to lose faith in it. And whilst making films is very hard work, it's also a lot of fun, a, a real creative challenge. I had a really deep desire to try and do it. And so many people over years had requested that I share what they described as my interesting and inspirational life with them. And something had kept nagging at me. My background in risk management had kicked in when ordering my equipment, always thinking, okay, if this breaks, then what do I do? So I'd ordered a lot more memory cards for the cameras that I'd normally use. A quick calculation suggested I could film for three weeks between electricity points if the 20 minute at a time MacBook charger held out for a weekly backup. So enough of sitting around melting in the heat feeling sorry for myself. This stupid company could either get its act together or sod off. I'd had enough waiting around in the heat changing my plans waiting on them to do nothing. Come what may, I was going to make a channel. Even if it took months before I could watch any of the footage. I was off to find and film some wildlife in the desert. With the wrong lens, incorrect shutter speed and hopeless aspirations that the footage would be watchable. We all have to start somewhere. As it turned out, almost everything I filmed over the following year, I did not see until I got home a year later. 99% of everything you're going to see over the next six series, I never got to view it, listen to the audio, or know if it was usable. I just filmed it blindly and hoped it was going to turn out okay. And here's what I found in Puros on the day I decided to forge ahead and do the best with what knowledge I had. I haven't got my tripod set up, so we're a little bit shaky shaky. This area is a Himba area, or so Herero people, who I'm told are fairly similar, at least by one. <laughs> and this is the remains of their settlement. This looks like their stockyard. So I've seen slightly better days with the wood. The gate also looks uh, interesting. But uh, there's usually lions in this area, they've actually been relocated somewhere else because they were causing so many problems. Yeah, had a good day actually, sort of got on top of the video filming organisational side of things. And the, only person at the campsite, I think probably the last tourist in Namibia, to be honest. <laughs> at the end of the day, nature gave me a little hint to show that perhaps I'd made the right decision. 
I just jumped into the shower at the campsite and had a quick sort of 10 minute shower. Came back, nice scene, setting sun, and uh, I noticed I've got a surprise visitor. <laughs> There's water in the, uh, in the river here at Puros. Apparently it was uh, sort of a week ago, just before I arrived, and uh, it's just started flowing, just in that 10 minutes that I've been in the shower. That's Chips and his family arriving to make sure that I've settled in okay. It was hard to be anything other than wonderful and magical on such a beautiful evening with the setting sun and the water. I really hope you're enjoying the channel so far. If so, if you'd be kind enough to share it with friends and family on social media, I'd really appreciate it. Coming up in the next episode, I open a gym in Puros as Delandi takes up swimming, which causes a rather stressful race against time.